Hello. Can you guys hear me? That works. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, today we're going to talk about casually executing arbitrary code uh, using AWS services. Uh, more specifically, we're going to be talking about how uh, we used AWS services to help uh, add some functionality to our platform that enabled our students to execute code uh, while they were learning lessons in their browsers. Uh, so before we get into the, uh, the good stuff, just a little bit about General Assembly. We are established in, in uh, 2011, uh, and we like to consider ourselves uh, an education company for the 21st century. Um, we offer a variety of courses in uh, data, design, and technology. Uh, we have 25 campuses, uh, over 25 campuses worldwide. Uh, we have over 40,000 student alumni, uh, and we work with 100 different uh, uh, business partners. Um, So the, the courses that we offer, um, we have a, a few different formats. Uh, we have uh, formats that, that range from uh, weekend workshops uh, that are like just one, two day events, um, all the way up to our most popular uh, uh, 12 week immersive programs. Um, so we also uh, offer these courses uh, to our enterprise customers um, who want to sort of retrain their, uh, their workforces in, uh, in sort of uh, uh, using our curriculums. Um, and so that's kind of where our uh, story starts. Uh, more specifically, uh, it starts around mid uh, Q2 of this year. Uh, one of our enterprise customers came to us and they wanted to retrain some of their students uh, using our data science curriculum. And so uh, at the same time, uh, our content team wanted to uh, refresh uh, the pre-work content that our students take on platform uh, before they get into the course. And so in order to do this, uh, one of the, the requirements was that the students are able to execute code uh, while they're in lesson. Um, we have found uh, through our, our sort of previous platforms and courses that uh, students who are able to execute code, uh, or rather students who are able to practice what they're learning uh, while they're learning it, uh, just retain that information better. Um, and so we wanted to give them the functionality so that while they're in the browser, they can execute SQL statements, Python statements, and actually um, you know, do that without having to stand up a whole environment, right? Uh, this was also not a, a new feature that, uh, that we wanted to roll out. This was something that we had kind of planned to do, um, but it was just kind of reshift the priorities. So we knew it needed to support our, our future content. Um, so this is also important. Uh, the other requirement that we had was that we couldn't actually use our legacy platform. Um, so we do have an existing platform that allows students to, uh, to do this, to, to execute code. For example, we have uh, SQL courses and JavaScript courses, and you can kind of do that on platform now. Um, but because we were refreshing this content, we couldn't actually use the uh, legacy platform. Uh, and finally, uh, this functionality had to be ready in a few weeks for QA. Um, so obviously, uh, we went back to the content team and we said, sure, uh, no problem, we'll take care of that. Uh, it's actually not what we said. We said, uh, you're blowing up our roadmap. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna push off, uh, push off things that we'd really like to be working on, and they said yes. We know we're sorry. Please do it anyway. And so we said sure. So uh, from an engineering standpoint, we also had a, a few requirements of our own. Um, in order to casually execute arbitrary code, uh, first and foremost, uh, it has to be secure, right? Um, the last thing you want is students to be able to uh, you know execute code on the platform that you know does Bitcoin mining or um, you know can hack into other services. Uh, so this was our top priority. Uh, again, uh, you know, as we pointed out earlier, uh, because we knew we were going to be migrating uh, other lesson content onto this uh, platform in the future, we had to support things like um, so, uh, Ruby, Java, uh, uh, Android development, iOS development, things, so other courses that we offer. We knew we would want to be able to support that functionality. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever we built today uh, would be feature proof. Uh, we also wanted this to scale easily. We're not a very large engineering team. Uh, we have no operations team whatsoever right now. And in fact, we, uh, we rely on a service like uh, uh, Heroku uh, for most of our other applications. So whatever we stood up, we wanted, to, be, we wanted to, to not have to worry about scaling it. We also naturally wanted this thing to be cost effective. Uh, we didn't want to have to worry about uh, you know, how often our students were executing code. We didn't want to have to worry about um, you know, limiting that at all. So whatever we stood up, we wanted to make sure that it was cheap to run. 
Uh, and, and last, but, but definitely not least, we, we wanted the service to be fast. Um, from a user experience perspective, uh, having your students you know, press run and see the results back instantly um, is just way more gratifying for, for them while they're learning. Uh, we wanted to try to get it to feel like they were executing it uh, on their local machine, or at least as close to that speed as possible. Um, so we, we looked at a few different options for this. We started with build versus buy, and we kind of very quickly ruled that out. So we went, to, we went down the build route, uh, and one of the things that, um, that we knew from a security perspective uh, was that we wanted to kind of avoid sandbox, uh, language-specific sandboxes. Um, they have proven in the past to not be 100% effective, uh, and they're also a little uh, tedious to set up. Every time you want to add support for a new language, you have to make sure that you're able to sandbox that code. Uh, so we were kind of leaning towards containers uh, for executing the code, um, something immutable, something that we can kind of stand up easily. Uh, but we knew that if we went down this build route with containers, even leveraging some AWS services, we'd probably have to put something in place to kind of orchestrate everything. And again, being a small engineering team, uh, we wanted to try to avoid having to wear anything like you know pagers and make sure the application was up. Uh, so we wanted to try to avoid that if we could. Fortunately, uh, exploring some of our options, uh, we came across Lambda. Um, and it actually fit all of our needs really well. Uh, and so we were able to avoid uh, having to do anything from an operations perspective. And we're going to explain why. Uh, so from a security standpoint, uh, Lambda gives you read-only containers out of the box. So er, when your Lambda function executes, uh, it's in a read-only container with the exception of temp. Um, and if you couple that with VPCs, you're able to lock down uh, the Lambda that the student's code is running in uh, so that it can't actually reach out to other network services. So you basically give them an environment that they can do whatever they want in, and you don't actually have to worry about uh, what it's reaching out to. It can't reach any other network services. It can't reach anything inside your network. Um, and so it just uh, it kind of eliminates that problem altogether. Uh, Lambda officially supports a few languages right now. Uh, they have a couple more languages on their roadmap for this year. But essentially, using a technique called shimming, um, you're able to execute any binary that you can uh, compile on Linux. Uh, so you package that binary with your service, um, and you can run whatever you want. And so uh, you can find examples of this online. You can run Go, you can run Ruby, you can run Swift, uh, even though they're not natively supported. Um, and as I mentioned, they're also planning on adding native support for Go. And I believe Go, PHP, and Ruby uh, slated for this year. I'm getting some nods in the back, so cool. Uh, scaling. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite parts. Uh, Going serverless essentially gives you opaque infrastructure. You don't care about the hardware at all. There are, of course, servers somewhere, uh, but you don't have to worry about it. So we wound up um, using API Gateway in front of Lambda, um, and that gives you the full serverless uh, stack. So you don't have to actually deploy any applications. It's all on, uh, it's all on AWS uh, using API Gateway and Lambda. No scaling, no worrying about how many servers it runs on. It doesn't matter how much load you throw at it. AWS is going to take care of it. From a cost perspective, uh, for our use case, Lambda specifically, uh, we get a million free requests per month. Uh, this is just part of their free tier. Um, it changes based on how much memory usage you're using. Uh, but out of the box for our use case, the majority of our requests uh, are free. Um, and beyond that, it's incredibly cheap. Uh, I think it's something like 20 cents per million executions uh, for our memory usage. Um, so it worked out really well here. Uh, and then. Uh, finally, our speed. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised to see uh, Lambda, uh, not only Lambda, but going through the API gateway, uh, round trip requests were turning in 50 to 100 milliseconds on average. Um, and from a student uh, experience perspective, they press the run button and they get instant results back, uh, which is great. We were really, really uh, surprised to see this. Uh, I was actually expecting a lot more overhead um, from, from the containers. And so uh, this is sort of the, the uh, kind of final product here. This is our MVP. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that using AWS services, we were able to get uh, from, from concept to a functioning prototype in under two weeks. Um, and this itself, I think the whole build time was something like five weeks. And very little of that was actually writing code. Um, so with that said, I'm going to hand it off to Graham. And Graham is going to explain uh, some of the fun stuff about how this actually works. Thanks. So 
this is the implementation we came up with. As Nick said, we spent a lot of time thinking about this, probably as much time thinking about coming up with this diagram as we spent actually implementing it. Um, the blue arrows are the flow of data through the app. Um, but yeah, so we focused really on making this as simple as we possibly could and leveraging as much of Amazon services as we could. Um, so it really has three main components. The client, which we just showed, uh, the API gateway, which is AWS service, and then our execution API, which is composed of three lambdas. Um, so the React client is our existing app. We wanted to encode as little information about code execution into the app as possible. Uh, we just wanted it to send out code, get a response, continue on with its day. The other thing it does is <clears throat> record all of the code submissions and results in a tin can learning record store. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it's a real fun API to work with. <clears throat> um, so then the next part is the API gateway, which is super easy to configure, um, especially with authorization, which going into this we thought was going to be a pretty big headache. Turns out you just point it at a Lambda that does the authorization for you. You get a result and it proxies it onto the Lambda that you want to call. So the execution API Lambda um, is made up of three parts. Um, so this receives the student's code along with some metadata about what it needs to execute. As this is in the context of teaching all of the code that we execute runs against unit tests in Python or expected results set in SQL. So uh, the fetch instruction step calls out to our instruction store uh, and then builds the execution plan and hands off to whichever lambda uh, is necessary. And the language lambdas, as Nick mentioned, run inside a secure VPC uh, that has no outside internet access. So it, it can only receive data from uh, the API Lambda and then pass back its result. Um, <clears throat> so then, yeah, the API Lambda passes its result back up through the proxy, back out to the React client, and the results get rendered. Um, so a couple of best practices that we figured out. Um, most of the demos that I've seen are full of code in the handlers, which didn't really work for us. Um, so this is literally our Python Lambda handler. Um, yeah, so it calls out to a very easily testable service object, um, which, so the part of the reason why we went with service objects is because we're big 12-factor fans. Uh, and the handler runs in an environment that we couldn't immediately replicate. Um, although we just saw a cool talk about SAM local, which will allow us to replicate uh, the Lambda stack much more closely. Um, but yeah, so service objects, super easy to test. Um, configuration wise, really worked out with our development strategy. Uh, yeah, and so our, our whole app is pretty small. It's 378 lines of code, including the tests for all three lambdas, including the serverless CLI configuration. Um, so it makes it really easy to work on. Like comparing this to even a reasonably sized Go implementation is just, yeah, it's night and day. Um, Yeah. How do you guys map from the code? Oh, can you repeat the question? Yes. So the question was, uh, how do we map from the student code uh, to the tests that are getting run? So in the request, we include some metadata 
that then is processed by the API Lambda to fetch the unit tests. Uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, yeah, so our workflow right now is we're using serverless CLI, which gives us uh, configuration in version control, which is really nice. Um, it also gives us per branch environments. It's really easy with serverless CLI to stand up a new environment, um, either for the entire gateway or just a single Lambda, if you wanted to test that. Um, so we have sandbox environment, staging environment, and production environment. Um, and also branch environments to run against branch environments of the React app. Um, yeah, and then once something goes to master, we have CI hooks that pick it up, and as soon as it's green, it gets deployed out to our staging branch. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that flow we find to be <clears throat> um, just really, really good for our productivity. Um, so next things that we're thinking about for this product definitely need a better end-to-end -end testing with some sort of local environment. Um, so a couple of, couple of options for that, but same local is looking up top of our list at this point. Um, the current implementation has the API Lambda calling the language-specific Lambdas, uh, and that Lambda is executing the entire time that the language-specific Lambdas are executing. So essentially, we're being billed for double the time, which is an ideal. So we're probably going to move out to a message queue, um, which definitely gives us some more parallelization options. Um, the content that we have right now is really pretty simple, but we're definitely going to be moving into things that have longer running test suites. And it would be really nice to be able to put all of the tests onto one queue and have them get picked up by different test runners uh, and execute simultaneously. Um, and then after that, currently everything's written in Python, uh, which is not the primary language for anyone on our team. Um, but it is one of the fastest startups uh, as far as Lambdas go. Um, but yeah, so depending on what it looks like with the Go support, I think that's where we're headed next. <laughs>